fearless commitment, trademark enthusiasm, manufacturing icon, infectious energy. These are just some of the descriptors for my guests today. I'm honored to be joined by a leader who has shattered glass ceilings and blazed a trail in the industry. I'm thrilled to welcome Medical Maven CEO and owner of Nephron Pharmaceuticals, Lou Kennedy. Welcome to Beyond the Mold, Lou. Thanks for joining me today. I am happy to um, be with you, and I'm honored that you asked. And I love the clever name, Beyond the Mold. (laughs) Thanks, Lou. So let's get straight to it. I'm sure when I just introduced you just now, many of our listeners who don't know you expected to hear the voice of a male with the name Lou. And I know this isn't the first time in your life you've heard that. Uh, And admittedly, I thought it was short for Louise. I'm sure this is pretty typical uh, situation you find yourself in. So what's the story behind your name, Lou? I'm an only child. My parents wanted a boy. My nursery was blue. Of course, back then they didn't know what sex they were having, but they wanted a boy. They had a boy's name picked out and I had a blue nursery. They never painted it. I just stayed that way. So I think that they had some uncanny sense about what I'd end up doing later in life because I'm always in a room full of men. And um, I think they must have had a little foreshadowing or something to uh, name me a man's name. And it isn't short for Louise. It's um, uh, just plain old Lou. And my mom said, well, you know, I've never had any girls in my classroom named Lou. And I said, there's a reason for that, mom. You know, all the male, all the people I know with the name Lou, it's either a nickname or it's uh, short for um you know, Lewis or Louise. So anyway, that's my name. And so I've, I've grown to embrace it, but it's also a, a nice or a nifty little trick when someone calls up and says, I need to speak to Mr. Kennedy. We know to screen the call. So it works. It has some pros too. <laughs> <laughs> has some good advantages to it. <laughs> so In one interview, you described a tough period in your life, but you see now in retrospect that that time in your life was actually a blessing in disguise. You know, what was the watershed moment for you? And, you know, looking back, how did you defy the odds and stay true to, you know, what many people have described as your winning spirit? And also, most importantly, while setting a positive example for your daughter. Well, thank you um, for asking me about this. I've often said Those years of my life enabled me to have a PhD in psychology. My um, ex-husband, my father's, the father of my child, had, uh, has, and had a very, very um, strong addiction problem. And um, I learned so much about how not to set off the anger and the temper and things like that, how to spot a con artist. So all those skills, rather than saying, oh, how rough the time that was, I look at it as what I learned from it. And I believe it's the way I was raised by my parents. You know, we have a very strong sense of the word faith and faith to get through things one step at a time. Things are worth fighting over. You know, if they're going to matter in 20 years from now, they're worth fighting over. And if you've got to get up and fight, then give it the good fight. So I think the, my upbringing is, and, and my, um, uh, the way my parents raised me and the church really helped me have a, a lot of faith. And I, I didn't realize how bad things were then until I look back and I see, you know, my power was being shut off. The water was being shut off. I had to do three jobs to try and make ends meet for my daughter. But I hope that she learned that you can't just, you know, you got to have a fallback plan. You got to have plan B and C and D and working hard is is just a hallmark of anybody's life. I mean, I'm proud of the hard work and um, I still treat each day as if I'm that same broke single mom that I got to get up and make it through the day and try to champion whatever I'm approaching that day. So I, and I, um, not everybody knows this about me, but I never once since I've been married to my husband, have ever looked at the final number on the tax return. I still think of myself as a broke single mom. That's amazing. That's incredible perspective. And something that I know sometimes you wake up in the morning and think if there's, you know, a saying on the mirror or something that you drive into the office and tell yourself, and, you know, that's an amazing, uh, I guess, reason to hustle every day. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no secret that I like to win. Um, I think, you know, I like to, win, I like to watch my teams win. And I like to see the um, team here at Nephron win in whatever the endeavor is. So I like winning. I like, I like to be around winners and help people be winners. Well, that's amazing. And that, that brings me to talk a little bit uh, about your career and sort of your leadership style today. And it's funny, you, you mentioned the logo on your fridge there with the female basketball team and, you know, talking about female led and actually certified female owned, you know, this obviously is just not just, you know, a philosophy for you. You live it, you breathe it, you walk the talk. And, you know, I can tell it's such a great sense of pride for you. And, so much uh, so that your business is recognized as certified woman owned. Can you tell our listeners about why this certification and in, in inspiring more women to lead is such a priority for you? Well, in the early days when we were considering it, it was a little bit, my husband's an only child as well. And so <laughs> there's a little bit of household competition. And I think folks, because my husband's 20 years older than me, think, thought in the beginning, oh, this is just going to be, um, you know, a placeholder. We'll make it a woman-owned business. But I was very eager to show that I have my hands, arms, and everything wrapped around what goes on here each and every day from the mis- minuscule thing to the macro um, thing that I need to consider. And so I plowed right in and made sure that, you know, I was capable of answering FDA or other types of audits that I don't have to rely on someone else to do it. And in doing that, I thought, you know, we should be recognized. I worked really hard to, you know, learn a new industry. I had no background whatsoever. I have a um, bachelor's degree in journalism, certainly not in, you know, making medication. And so I was just convinced that I needed to have that um, encompassing knowledge. And I feel like knowledge is power. And so the, um, the early days, it was just to be recognized for doing the hard work that I, you know, we, we've been able to accomplish. Now, what I can tell you is some stats today about our company, without even really trying, we are 53% female in this company. Almost all of the department heads are female. We have over 44 countries represented here, so we're extremely diverse. And the stats will tell you the more diverse you are, the more productive you are. So I, I do think it starts with the fact that I'm in a non-traditional role as a female. And I think others in the community may tend to apply here. Well, if she can do it, I can do it. So I think without setting out to be that many, you know, the, the ratio for females to be that high, it's happened organically. And so a um, lot of talent here. And I, I like to say, I don't really look for the right um, female. I look for the right person for the role. And in our case, we've ha- you know found a lot of really talented females, a lot of really talented males as well. Good. You talk, you know, I've, I've read, you tell the story about your career and, you know, how you started out Nephron building up the sales force and then taking over uh, as CEO and, you know, how under your leadership, you've ex- experienced such tremendous growth, you know, $300 million in investments in just the last two years. I, I think how many, so many of these are items are noteworthy, but when you actually sit back and, and reflect, what stands out the most to you? Watching the people working here blossom. That is a favorite thing about what I do. Just seeing somebody get an opportunity, run with it, and realize their own potential and help to, to, to make that happen. That's my favorite thing about what I do. And you mentioned the words management style. I would say, fortunately and unfortunately for the folks that are employed here, I'm more like a mom in my management style. So when things are going well, mom's really happy. When things aren't going well, it kind of takes a toll on the whole team. So I think it's important for me to try and keep everything pushing ahead and happy. And I, that's a big statement given that I've had the last three weeks of um, six investigators from FDA in visiting us. So I'm eager to get back to day-to-day work as I knew it three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a little bit of mama bear to me. <laughs> A lot of it. (laughs) 
So if you look back to where you started to where you are today, and you mentioned, you know, you were an only child of a school teacher who aspired to be a food writer or a TV chef. I had a, I had a good giggle with that one, you know, and now to the CEO and owner of a certified, you know, woman owned leading medical company. That's quite the shift, you know, walk me through your journey. And who knew in the 80s how much money Paula Dean was going to make as a Southern um, chef on TV? I mean, maybe I, maybe I could have made more money if I had stuck with the original dream. But um, I, um, I, I just have loved every step of the way. And I didn't so much have a, a real plan as I've taken each experience and parlayed into what I do now. So whether it's, you know, working a lot of jobs and a lot of hours, whether it's sales, whether it's been in marketing, all of the things that I've done up to this point in some way touches what I do every day, whether it's people skills, public relations, um, special event coordination, all those things I get to do in my role here at Nephron. And so I would say, how's it going? We're just on an uphill climb and keep breaking barriers. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thrilled for where we are and where we're going. And, you know, <laughs> over two years ago, I had no idea that I was going to be in the molecular biology business. But I said, by gosh, we're going to have a CLIA certified lab so we can keep our employees safe and working through the pandemic. Now that has turned into, we're now about on May 18th to open a wellness center to treat all of our employees and their families for free and do all the testing in the molecular biology lab that was originally started for COVID. So I try to take some of these ideas that pop in my head and then figure out a way to make them um, profitable or pay for themselves or, you know, whatever the, the original purpose was to stay healthy. And that's turned into something even bigger and better for our employees. So, um, you know, I also didn't set out to have a nitro glove business and somehow that popped up last summer. And um, I've been fast working on my business that I'm so thankful and I'm not being paid to say this. I'm so thankful for the help Husky has given us to help me navigate this injection molding business that's soon to open. I mean, I had the wild idea and then started purchasing equipment and then said, maybe I need some help. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't have much, as good a plan on that idea. And so thank goodness for Husky to help me, you know, get me between the lanes and, and, and driving that project forward. So we're looking forward to um, seeing how that's going to unfold here soon. I like how you jumped into it because there's really, you know, no greater leadership test than guiding a company through, you know, uh, uncharted waters or unprecedented certain circumstances. And this pandemic has certainly pushed the boundaries and pushed us into places we never thought we'd be before. But, you know, it doesn't mean that it's impossible to overcome. And what you just said now about, you know, I bought the equipment first and figured it out later. Um, you know, that just shows that, you know, obviously you think nothing's impossible. So, you know, in terms of some of the unique challenges that you and the team at, at Nephron have recently faced, what do you think enabled you to sort of navigate these times and be successful? I mean, you talked about two key uh, the, the nitrile glove, um, you know, facility, and also now, you know, uh, the other investment that you've got coming up. How did you navigate these times? <laughs> well, there's a third one, Tracy. We also, when the pandemic started, I said, we need to be able to fill vaccines if we're needed. So we started construction on a brand new wing. I have received two um, filling lines for filling vaccines. I'm getting those installed as we speak. We finally moved in, started moving into the building January 1 of this year of that wing of the building. So I've got to go out there and find a vaccine partner. In the meanwhile, because I have the wing and the space, we've been approached by countless folks asking us, could you make this or that? Nothing to do with the vaccine. And I'm so happy that we charged forward because now we've got available space for some really new and exciting endeavors for our company with a couple of new partners. So, um, you know, I don't always have a rock solid plan, but I know we can make something of it if we, you know, again, it goes back to that faith, having the faith that 
You've got the talent, the people, the team. Now, what are we going to come together to make great out of the, you know, the opportunity? Yeah, I think that's where uh, things will come up that you probably from out of the pandemic would have never imagined, uh, you know, and opportunities. And if you're there and you're there at the right time with the right solutions, it's it's amazing what can happen. So it's really exciting for you. I called our governor early on and I said, if I were to get in the CLIA laboratory business, don't you think I could help take some of the stress off of the hospitals for nothing but just community testing? And he said, Lou, go for it. And I mean, within three weeks, we had the lab certified and built out. We had a plan, um, a drive through tent set up, and we're still to this day giving vaccines out of that drive through line. And I was fortunate enough to have our neighbors, Dominion Energy, loan me the land so it'd be right off of a major interstate. And we're still seeing patients two years later as a result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm happy about, I'm happy how that worked out. And that, I mean, that wasn't anywhere in my radar, you know, three months before. Yeah, no, it's amazing how uh, things have you know, shifted and, and opportunities you probably could have never imagined have, have uh, popped up. So I guess I didn't congratulate you earlier, but congratulations on your uh, recent win for the Manufacturing Icon uh, Award from the National Manufacturing Association. That's quite an honor. Um, this is another and a number, or I guess, long line of uh, incredible accolades you've received for your contributions. You mentioned now just the community and speaking with the governor and, you know, the medical industry in general. Um, if you had to choose just one of those, uh, you know, recognitions, what would you say you're most proud of? Well, it's not about me, but I was really, 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 really tickled to receive a Facility of the Year Award because I poured my heart and soul into the design of this company. And so then that was early on. And to follow that up with this Manufacturing Icon Award it just validates and confirms we're doing great things with our team and for the um, public at large and for patients. And so I think the it, it's, it's a good day to tell people you're manufacturing. Years ago, people looked at it as a, a sweatshop or a, you know, a dirty factory. And we're, in fact, more of a tech company that, by the way, produces life-saving medications. And so I'm, um, I'm very thrilled about those two because... You know, I look at Nephron, um, the physical building and the company that homes along inside of it as my baby. So <laughs> I like getting that facility of the year award a whole heck of a lot. And then I was thrilled. They had never named a manufacturing icon. I was the first ever to receive it. So there was just underscore good times 10, right? <laughs> Well, and I also found in my research in 2019, um, you were awarded the Healthcare Entrepreneur of the Year. And when I think about the definition or the traditional definition of, you know, entrepreneur, it's usually synonymous with someone who is early on in their career, maybe just getting started or looking to prepare their, propel their business forward, you know, for a startup, for example, for you, it's quite the opposite. You know, 2019 isn't that long ago. So, you know, uh, what did this recognition you know, mean to you? Well, funny enough, at the it was uh, the the function was held in Atlanta. All the way there, I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm not even going to win. This is something. My husband's like, you know, do we really need to make this trip? So I was watching as other awards were given out in different sectors, and it seemed like the first few to win happened to be like out of five, the fourth one on the list. So I'd already looked at Bill and I said, I'm not the fourth one on the list. So you're probably right. This may just have been a a wasted trip to Atlanta. So when they called my name, I was like third on the list. I'm still, because it wasn't believable to me. And so my friend was winning a lifetime achievement of the year, which made it all the more special, a lady named Anita Zucker. And she was seated with her family at the table next to ours. She jumps up and starts clapping, and I'm still waiting for the fourth person to stand up. So it was pretty surreal. I, I was um, just delighted to, to have that honor. 
And in recent years, probably since 2018, I've become friends with an Irish fashion designer who happens to be named Louise Kennedy. And so sure enough, uh, not only do we look like we could be sisters, we almost have the same name. And she won the same honor in Dublin. So it's, uh, it's it makes me um, very happy that Ernst & Young would even consider me. So that was a, a nice award. I have it sitting on the front of my desk. Yeah, it's an it's a great program, and uh, I always thought it was traditionally for startups. So it was really interesting when, you know, I read a little bit more and you the know, old gal of- got in the run. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's okay. And you were third on the list versus fourth. So I think that's even better. <laughs> and it was after I was being such a dummy, it was all by alphabetical order. It just was coincidental, of course, that the two or three that were called before me happened to be fourth on the list. So my theory was debunked. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, I talk about, um, you know, early on in your career, you talked about taking chances and, you know, don't always have the plan, but I'm going to take a chance and move the business forward. You know, looking back, you know, what were those, what were some of those critical decisions? And maybe there was a chance that you took that maybe you wish you hadn't taken. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh yeah. There have been some trip ups, but I'm not afraid to fail. And that's probably my biggest advice to anybody because out of failure, some of the best ideas are hatched. And so if you if you approach everything, well, if I fail, I'm just going to figure out a way to do it better than I originally planned or pivot. And as a private company, um, we're we're able to have that kind of flexibility. We can um, and we, in fact, coined it a group of us in a planning session a year or so ago. The word that probably most defines our company is a, a word we made up pivotability. It's just the one word that we can turn on a dime and and make things happen. And it helps us, you know, to be able to compete against these large pharma companies, you know, that are in the same um, drug categories as some of the things that we make. So, um, I mean, you know, there have been a couple of products that I thought were going to be huge and just weren't. Uh, You know, there's just been some things like that. There's, uh, you know, one particular product we we took a big leap of faith and bought pl- plenty of raw material and didn't end up using it so that you know took a lot loss on that so i mean we all make mistakes but i'm not afraid of that and i think if we if we're going to be successful we we have to take risks and you can't be afraid to fail you just have to figure out what to do in the event of failure to make something better mm-hmm and you took the words right out of my mouth, uh, you know, looking at sort of the next topic we talked about, uh, you know, I've read so much about how you've pivoted your business, um, you know, given 85% of the world's medical devices are imported and, you know, that imbalance was really exposed, uh, you know, over the course of the past two years with the pandemic. And now you've, I would say, made it your mission and, you know, I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but to ensure that, you know, uh, Americans have access to American made PPE medical devices you know, vaccines, how have you been able to make an impact in this area, you know, locally and, you know, in your view, uh, in the country as a whole? Well, we've invested in um, our part owners with Nephron Nitro Glove business. The um, We want to make our own syringes, plunger rods, caps, and so forth. And thank goodness for Husky, we might actually get there in the, in the near future. Um, I have made it my business to talk to all of the vendors, with whom we do business and suggested, would you like an East Coast present? Would you presence in America? Would this be a place that you might? And I'm proud to say two or three of the people I just kind of threw it out there are actually looking at property in this industrial park. So I think my my uh, unabashed side hustle is I've somehow elected myself to be a part of economic development in South Carolina uh, because I'm always trying to you know cheerlead for what a great place to do business it is here in South Carolina. Um, you know, we have the fourth, believe it or not, even though we're a small, um, not very wealthy state, we have the fourth largest number of interstate highway system. All of the rails um, comes through here. We have a newly expanded in, um, port in, the, in Charleston, South Carolina, who didn't get backed up like the ports on the West Coast in New York um, at the worst of the pandemic. So, 
I mean, there are a lot of compelling reasons, and I never shy away from a chance to talk about come, you know, come on down and do a little business with us. Sure, I probably said something to your leadership at some point. Oh, why would you want a, a Husky uh, location right here in South Carolina? I'd be down with that. <laughs> I thought it was uh, a cute pun or play on words when I heard nephron nitrile. And, you know, really, I think it's anything but, um, you know, this is a new and exciting venture uh, for your business. And what's your, you know, vision for this in terms of contributing to the localization, you know, of the production of these medical supplies that are critical? Yes. And what we felt like, you know, onshoring, reshoring, getting things back here like America was known for in the turn of the century has been a little bit of a mantra of mine even before the pandemic. So this just, you know, really put in, in my terms, a laser focus on being a part of this. So when um, some friends said, what about nephron nitrile? I said, oh, well, that's got a ring to it. And we have the distribution and the infrastructure. So we are going to be producing ex exam gloves, later sterile exam gloves, and finally ending up with surgeon's gloves. And I think it dovetails nicely with the hospital population that I already um, talk to on a regular basis. You know, those are my customers. And so I think sterile gloves, sterile medications, it, it falls nicely into a, a good medical basket. And then for me to get the ability to sell sterile um uh, syringes. This is all just, it just fits. And so I'm not only happy to control my own supply of these things, but also be able to get back because both the gloves and um, syringes were both in steep shortage as uh, governments around the world were building up their national stockpiles and hospitals were overrun with patients. I mean, it was just a real problem. And, and so we like being a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like there was a scramble there for a little while. Now, everybody's figuring out sort of what's the next, uh, you know, thing that we need to make sure that we're we're ahead of. And it sounds like you've got that well in hand. Um, you talked about maybe one day I'll get in the gowning garments business. <laughs> well, you're connected to a good fashion designer by the sounds of it. So <laughs> you talked. Uh, you just said something there about giving back, and uh, you know, as the child of a school teacher, it seems that you know, education is, you know, really part of your DNA, whether it's having, you know, students visit Nephron. Um, we've seen lots of that on social media, uh, you know, to exploring manufacturing careers, even your state science fair, you know, handing out awards uh, or internships at Nephron. It seems really important to you to inspire young people and educate them uh, about careers in the manufacturing industry. Why is that so important? Well, it's even, um, a part of the design of the building, I said to the architects and engineers, I want everything we do in this plant to be visible through glass so that we can host children. In America, we have a law or OSHA has a rule that children under the age of 11 can't be allowed onto a factory floor. So everything in our plant can be viewed through glass. And my goal there was to inspire future chemists, machinists, uh, microbiologists, and other um, disciplines that we have here. So even the design of this facility was meant with education in mind. We hired a certified school teacher to be the person who leads tours and recruits classrooms to come here and take a visit. And I'm so happy to say we're back doing that again. You know, for a long time, we didn't host any field trips and school was out anyway. So uh, just this morning, we had a, um, travel abroad class from Spain visiting. Last week, there was a class from France. And so, again, it all goes goes nicely with my plan for diversity and uh, future employees and recruiting. So it's, it's you know, it could be any day of the week you're seeing people touring through our facility. And I, I love the fact that we have an educator program here that teachers can come in and pick up part-time work for $21 an hour. And that's been going on now for the third straight year. And the unintended consequence of that educator program is, A, it helps me while we're here on a, in America. That's a war on talent. We just, we have such low unemployment that, you know, you're trying to fill positions with not a huge pool. So this 
part-time helpers are amazing, but the unintended consequences, they take what they learn here back into their classrooms and say, this is why it's important to study chemistry, or this is why it's important to pay attention in biology class. And so I have, um, have such a respect for how hard the teachers work and how much they deserve for training our future leaders. I try to celebrate education in any way, shape, or form that I can. Yeah, and I watched that uh, NBC story. And so tell me about the red uniforms. What? Why are those so significant in this program? In our uh, facility, there are different color scrubs for the formulation team, the um, engineers, the uh, chemistry lab coats, and things like that. So when we just started the educator program, I said, we need red for the educators like a teacher's red apple. And so even the color scrubs, when they're coming and going in and out of the facility, it cheers you up. Like, it's just happy. And I never dreamed that when this whole educator thing started, one of the biggest questions they asked, so we can go to the bathroom anytime we want. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't realize we had such a perk. <laughs> and we're doing that right. They don't have to ask for permission. <laughs> Yeah, I think of the uh, the red pen when my uh, assignments used to get marked up instead of the apple. I don't know. <laughs> but I saw, no, there was a great story uh, on NBC of uh, one of the mothers who was a teacher and uh, how inspiring that program was for her and her family. So congratulations. That's a great it initiative. It was so nice that they followed up one year later and showed her putting the keys to her new home in the door for making her, you know, down payment money from working these extra part-time hours here. So we were, uh, we all celebrated when she opened the door and walked through the, the threshold. That's so exciting. So if we look at, uh, you know, South Carolina, I know you've got, you know, a lot of uh, love for, for your state and it was impacted by the pandemic in, in so many different ways as well. And, you know, being a local business owner, employer and community ambassador, how did you and the, the team at Nephron step up and lead the way to give back and make sure that residents were able to get access to supplies or vaccine or other supports that they might have needed? I mean, we did anything and everything that we could from actually opening up a child care downstairs in our building for a number of months as though so many daycares were shut down. I tried so hard to support the local restaurant owners by having food for 50 catered in by different restaurants every day. And we did that for three, four, five months straight. Um, get Just making sure people had some revenue coming in. You know, I ordered things from like clothing stores for the employees here just so a small business owner wouldn't have to shut his doors. Uh, just little things like that. We we also did and are still doing testing for the community and for the employees and vaccine um, uh, administration. We, we, I don't know, the list just grows longer and longer. I was asked by our governor to serve on a task force called Accelerate SC, where people from all across the state came together in the Capitol, stretched eight feet apart, and we um, discussed what we would do with CARES money or the ARPA funds and gave our recommendations to the governor so he could then give that to the legislature here in our state. So there were a lot of reaching across aisles, helping each other out. I mean, at one point, I invited a barber and a um, esthetician to come in here sit outside on a stool and trim people's hair, you know, spritz it off with water so people could get a haircut. I mean, we were just trying to do whatever we could to thank these team members, as scared as we all were, especially early on, for coming in to work and helping us get the medication. I mean, even the salesperson who wasn't allowed to go in the hospital would drive the medications, at least here in South Carolina, he'd take them and hand deliver them we did the same with giving out hospitals hand sanitizer that we made here per FDA's instructions. I mean, there was just a lot of little examples of working with and throughout the community and the state to, to be, you know, an answer to some of the problems we were all facing. Yeah, that's amazing. I know the list goes on and it's, it, you think, you know, if you look back, I would have never thought we'd be saying two years later, you know, here's all, here's all the things we've done, but it's amazing how, 
you know, you've been able to contribute. So I guess I'm coming to the close of our time together. And I I have one sort of, I guess, uh, question in terms of sharing some wisdom with us. Uh, If you were to mentor a young person, and you probably do, I'm sure you have in your career, um, you know, someone who is maybe struggling to move forward in their career, facing similar challenges or doubting themselves and their abilities, what would you tell them or what would you share from their experience that might inspire them to stay the course and pursue their dreams? Well, anytime I speak to students or young folks, I always share that don't be afraid to fail. And so many times we're, you know, we're risk averse and we won't put ourselves out there. And I'm always encouraging women particularly speak up and have a voice, make yourself relevant in the situation. And if you make a mistake or, fail, you, you know, or something fails along the way, learn from it and just do it better the next time. I think that's just so, so very important. And then I have a friend who's president of Bank of America here in South Carolina, and I've stolen her phrase. You must lift as we climb. And I take that very personally. And I'm forever trying to answer any female that wants to, you know, ask me for advice of how is it to, how does it feel to be a woman with this type of responsibility? And, you know, I will tell you that once a year, we have all of our employees get together. It takes three days to do it to cover all the shifts and the number of people that we have. And it's in those three days that. It, it hits me because I see 350 of them sitting each day in front of me, how many lives I'm responsible for making the right decision. And it you know, causes me to have a big lump in my throat every year. I know it's coming, but I, I, I do it every year. And I think, you know, I just say, say my prayers that I will make good decisions that help support employees and their families and d- just do the best that we can. And Hopefully we're training the next batch of leaders as we do it. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to thank you, Lou, for joining me today. I'm sure I speak for our listeners when I say that you've certainly, you know, not only blazed the trail in the medical industry for Nephron, but demonstrated leadership qualities that, you know, so many aspire to, not only young female leaders, but, you know, many business leaders around the globe. Um, you know, with the amazing work that you and the Nephron team are doing and congratulations on your success to date, you know, and I wish you all the best as you continue the amazing work uh, that you're doing, especially providing much needed support to your community educators and the medical industry. So thanks for your time today. Thank you um, for even wanting to hear my story. Thank you for listening. And I feel again, very honored that you would ask. And I hope that, um, somehow we inspire at least one person from this podcast. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lou.